fistula following uh, as a complication of spinal cervical spinal surgery okay it was an interesting case it was a very interesting case okay okay we we can see through it afterwards in on it was good your webinar went well it went i i i, uh, I, I came out uh, yeah. hi so yeah. sorry to interrupt uh, we are live we welcome you all to the world premiere of the grand rounds of spine surgery and to introduce today's speaker i hand over the proceedings to dr shailesh hadgaonkar uh good evening everyone uh, thank you uh, dr neeraj uh, bijlani and dr ashok sham uh, from ortho tv for giving us uh, constant support uh, today we are uh, having dr sajan hegde as the national stalwart and uh, uh the master for grand rounds uh, this is our third grand round uh, world premiere uh, on uh, ortho tv and our second uh, uh, master faculty is dr kern singh who is uh, from chicago to brief you about uh, dr sajan hegde uh, i really don't think we are, dr hegde needs any introduction uh, dr sajan hegde is a pioneering spine surgeon uh, in india and he is a worldwide figure as we all know one of the few people who started uh, practicing spine in the 80s and 90s uh, uh, in last uh, decade and uh, uh, as we all know he is trained with cotrell and dabuse uh, the concept of instrumentation scoliosis anterior surgery and lot of advanced instrumentation is all come up from sajan hegde in india and uh, he is a uh, innovative surgeon he keeps innovating himself and the technical uh, technicalities today he is, uh, dr hegde is known as the robotic surgeon in spine as he is having extensive experience of robotic spine for last couple of years to know about uh, dr kern singh again uh, he is a stalwart and a uh, minimally invasive guy you know, one of the world uh, leader i can say he is written lot of textbooks on minimal invasive surgery dr kern singh is practicing at uh, chicago rush university as a director and uh, a spine surgeon he is uh, uh, popular in a uh, lot of uh, aspects like he is a fitness enthusiast even dr hegde is a fitness enthusiast today both of them are very 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 fit surgeons at the same time dr kern singh is known for outpatient surgery as he is doing a lot of minimal invasive surgery uh, on uh, day day care where his patients come in the morning and go the same day even if it is cervical corpectomies or uh, multi level surgeries in lumbar and cervical spine we welcome you both dr hegde and uh, dr kern singh today's uh, third uh, grand rounds is on mixed cases as uh, the first and second were there and i uh, myself uh, shailesh adgaonkar along with my colleague uh, dr abhay nene from mumbai will be comparing the grand rounds and will be taking you through the series of cases over to you dr nene and at the same time i would like to thank maharashtra orthopedic association dr ajit chinde uh, pune orthopedic society uh, dr uh, narayan karne and sanjeeti hospital for giving uh, constant support for this uh, grand rounds and uh, uh ortho tv for supporting us thank you very much and over to you dr nene lovely thank you so much for that introduction and thank you so much guests for uh, coming for this grand round cuz uh, we are going to take you through an orthopedic spine ward and uh, we are going to be presenting to you cases that have got admitted in the last few days and we'd like your opinions on how to think through these cases you know what your planning would be if you need any new investigations or anything special uh the the case obviously is in the ward so we may not be able to see the conclusion of what happened but we get, just like to pick on your minds and find out how you think about these cases so uh, thank you again our first lady is a lady from the farms and she's a young farmer who's admitted with um, a long standing back pain which has been disabling for her which has been progressive and uh, of the recent past she's now developed uh, bilateral claudication so now she's significantly disabled they've traveled a long distance and uh, landed up in our hospital 2 uh, days ago and we told her that we'd like to present uh, her situation to two masters of uh, varying denominations of seniority and get uh, a young mind and a senior mind to think about uh, what uh, what to offer because her um, uh, images are something like this and within us we had a lot of debate on what we could offer her she's uh, run out of all the injection and re rehabilitation options so she's here looking for a solution Uh, may i throw the ball into the court of dr sajan hegde 
it's a it's a tall central disc with significant compression, no neurology, just pain. But she's disabled and she's looking for a solution. What would what might that be, sir? I I am just studying these uh, pictures uh, abai, and I see on her flexion film and. Uh, I see a little bit of trans uh, translation, a few millimeters. I don't know if Kern will will agree with that. Uh, with maybe me. Uh, this is what you're talking about, isn't it? Uh, if you look at the back, back yeah, right, yeah. There. There's a little bit of translation. I'm not sure if it is there. I'm not sure if Kern will agree with that. And uh, she's a young lady. She's she's a farmer. You say she's active. And uh, obviously, uh, and also, and the other thing that draws my attention, that draws my attention, is the fact that her L5 is sacralized, and all these things would go into the decision making. I also see there is some effusion in the axial cut, uh, the there, effusion yeah. in the in the in the in the in the facet uh, joint capsule. I would like. Uh, I think this is right up Kern's alley. Let him say what he would like to do, and then <laughs> I will. Uh, I will say what I would do. You know. Uh, in, in so, my uh, Kern, for your information, Dr. Sajan Hegde is known as the Andre Agassi. He's the best return of server. So he's put the ball back in your court. You want to take it from there? Well, could you? I'd be, I, I, well, my pleasure. First of all, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. It's always a, an honor and a privilege to 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 be associated with such stalwarts in spine surgery. If you could go back two slides for me, that one. Go back. Yep. No. How does how does Sajin have so much hair there? <laughs> so <laughs> the answer is here. Can you see the date down uh, there, Kern? That's okay. six okay. many moons ago. And okay, I just want to make sure. It seemed outdated. <laughs> so I just, I just, I just assumed that the, that his recommendation would also be outdated. So that's why this is an old slide presentation. So for me, the answer is simple in this individual. This is a 30-year-old active female. I put almost no, um, no stock into the fact that she has back pain, zero. Back pain is so multifactorial that it doesn't factor into my algorithmic equation for treatment. For me, this case used to be very challenging. It's still challenging, but it's very challenging because central disc herniations are very hard to get to in a traditional fashion, whether that be a standard McCullough approach or a tubular approach, they're very challenging. And oftentimes it leads to kind of, a, kind of an under decompression or under removal of the disc herniation. So for me, in this case, this is an endoscopic approach, transforaminal discectomy. I think that at the end of the day, she's stuck in flexion. She's probably worse in flexion. There's a tight canal. You can see clumping of the roots. I think her problem is, is stenosis and narrowing. And the worst case, I always I could convert that to an easier um, uh, MIS fusion at some point down the road if she does develop some kind of instability. But I think her problem right now is, is stenosis due to a large central HNP. It's a little bit more challenging to get from a traditional approach. So a classic Indian farmer is going to come back to you and ask you, sir, what are the chances that I may, I may need another no, another operation after your minimally invasive surgery? Would we answer that for her? So I, I just go out of anecdote, and I don't think I have any good data to support it. And I would say that at the end of the day, the, um, the likelihood that you need surgery depends more on your back pain complaints than anything else. And, and my, my take on this in your population, at least the population presented to me, is that she's a skinny patient and she's active. And unlike in the United States, she has to work to survive. And so she, she will have a high tolerance and high threshold to come back. So the likelihood that she comes back, I believe is really low in that sense. I don't have a number. I tell patients in the United States, 15 to 20% chance that they may need some other re-additional operation. And that's not necessarily based upon any science, but we also have a population that's probably less motivated and less requiring to work either physically or in a high demand level like this. So just two technical questions regarding the transforaminal endoscopic approach. Uh, do you think the iliac crest is a bit too high for uh, comfort on the x-ray? And do you think the disc be, uh, the iliac crest is sitting there? Uh, do you think the, uh, the fact that she's had a pain for two years and this looks like a large central chronic disc 
suggest that this is a dehydrated disc that may not be easy to pull out through the endoscope? Yeah, so that's what I was trying to, I was just trying to look at the, the, the plane films. If you actually look, Sajin mentioned it was a transitional vertebrae below. So in some ways, that's kind of a little bit favorable. The crest comes up partially to the neural foramen on the one side, but you typically use an angle down approach. So I think that the four or five level is accessible. And the worst case of this is that um, you can come um, through two separate incisions if you, couldn't, if you couldn't drop your hand enough to get down across from the, you know, from the you know, portal, uh, for a unilateral approach. So you could do it bilateral and get the disc out. Uh, the chronicity doesn't necessarily matter because you, you, when you enter into the foramen, you know, everything that's above the disc, you just bite out and resect and move across. So I'm a little bit less worried about that, but the crest is a factor in this, but I think it's still favorable. Uh, so regarding the chronicity of the disc or the fact that it could be a hard disc, it's not a problem you said? Yeah, because you know, at, at the end of the day from the transferamal approach, it's that the, the working portal acts as the sheath for the dura. So on the your your the the sheath is is dorsal. So everything below is is disc herniation. Or sorry, the, the, the fecal sac is is dorsal and everything below is the disc. So you can actually physically just burr across if it's calcified with the with the cannula against the dura and you can clean down and plane down. So it actually is it, it makes it a little bit less challenging in some ways. Right, that's awesome. So, Dr. Hegde, you're this patient and your surgeon has, uh, you know, uh, suggested this operation. What questions are you going to ask him? Are you happy to buy this option? Uh, coming from Kern, I know I can buy this option, but it would worry me a little bit, uh, like all Indian patients, that there is a fair chance that I might have to come back again. Uh, and that would uh, impact my thinking as a surgeon. So what is, what is your option of choice here? For me, uh, when I look at the, uh, like look at those things that I mentioned, the fact that her, is, her L5 is sacralized, the fact that her other discs are uh, well hydrated and it's just a one segment problem. I, and the fact that she is a hard working lady, I would, uh, and also the fact that she may not be very eager to come back again for another surgery, I would offer her, her uh, a standard TLF uh, surgery. Yes, unfortunately, she's heard Dr. Singh's uh, comments before you. So she's asking you that uh, you're doing such a big job for me. Uh, are you going to do this <laughs> to guarantee me a relief from back pain, number one? And are you going to guarantee me that I'm not going to have another operation after yours? That's, that's exactly what I would say, that uh, the chances of you having to come back to me would be very, very low after that. And what about uh, freedom from back pain, sir? Also, she would have good relief in, in the back pain. So you pretty much believe that a fusion will take away back pain uh, versus a decompression alone, whichever way it is done in? I would think so, yes. Right. So, sir, if you had to point out five points here, why you would go for a fusion rather than a microdiscectomy or any other form of discectomy, uh, how would those five pan out? I Are mean, you Tall, yeah, you, you, no, Dr. Hegde, a tall, tall disc, does that have any bearing, the height of the disc? Uh, to, to an extent it has, but uh, for me, uh, that alone is not the main factor on which I make the decision. So the fact that it is, uh, the alpha is sacralized, the disc is well and truly dehydrated, large central uh, prolapse. And the fact that the facet joints are showing some effusion, I think this whole segment is a little unstable. I think it needs to be, it needs a little more than just a decompression. So one final question, in place of a 30 year old farmer, if this was a uh, 75 year old retired homemaker, would you still go by the same decision with every, all other factors uh, unchanged? Maybe uh, in the older person with exactly the same picture, a, de a plain decompression would be an option. Maybe. Dr. Singh, uh, just to get you back on the frame, uh, in case you had a dural rupture because you were playing against some bony fragments in the through the scope, how do you go forward uh, in that situation? Yeah, so, you know, it's actually interesting <laughs> because in, a, in an older patient, I would be more apt to do a fusion than a, than a younger active individual. So can you just explain kind of that? 
Well, you know, the, the, the reoperation at that point, or, you know, at the, at the end of the day, depending upon their level of functioning and mobility and their work demands or their life demands would be lower. So I'd be less likely to want to reoperate on them. So my, my thinking actually would be a little bit reversed. And if I was going to do a fusion on this individual, I would want to see the vessel anatomy, but I'd probably go OLIF. I'd go anterior OLIF and go standalone. Um, so I don't disrupt any of your posterior muscle. I'm worried about her at 30 for re reoperation adjacent level. And we know even when placed perfectly, not necessarily with the robot, but we have um, potential for facet violation adjacent level um, segment problems. But uh, going back to the endoscopic approach, it's really interesting. And people, when I first started doing the endoscope, and I'm only a couple of years into the endoscope, so I can't say I'm some master proficient endoscopist, but you really don't see dural tears. And why don't you see it? It's because the sheath and the cannula are your dural retractor. So it's the ultimate when you dock, when you place the spinal needle and you place the docking portal, the sheath is always against the dura. Now, the time that you can see a dural tear is typically a pinpoint tear with the initial spinal needle going in. And then you catch the, you catch either the traversing or the exiting route, depending upon where you are in the foramen. But um, you don't really don't see much. And it's, a very small pinpoint tear on the undersurface. So you don't really do much to the, you don't do much for the, the durotomy. You actually just leave it. And then it, it's backfilled with all that epidural fat and there's no dead zone. There's no void left once you remove the endoscope. Oh, well, that's great. So I, probably, I probably have had dural tears, to be honest, I don't know. But if there's truly like we say that in the MIS tube case, oh, don't worry about the dural tear. There is a dead space. With an endoscope, there is zero dead space. Right. Great insight. Uh, Shailesh, uh, Dr. Shailesh Hargaukar, this patient ad admitted under you, we've got expert opinions, but ultimately you're going to have to uh, draw the ballot. So uh, how, 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 what are we going to do for her tomorrow, sir? I uh, completely agree and echo with uh, both uh, Dr. Hegde and uh, Dr. Kern. Uh, but as uh, we see a lot of patients like this, farmers and uh, uh, they, those who really need to do a lot of work in the fields, uh, most important criteria for me is how bad is the back pain and uh, if the back pain is uh, not as bad as leg pain, then I will probably go for only decompression, whatever, minimal invasive. But you heard her story, it's two years of back pain and yeah. uh, six months of leg pain. Yeah, if the patient is demanding, I will go for a standard T leaf. You know, L4, 5 T leaf, that okay. will be the answer from my side. Okay. Because so we'll take a call, we'll discuss with the lady and then decide what to do. Over to you, sir, for the next patient. Yeah. Uh, so this next uh, patient is uh, also from nearby place where the first lady was. And uh, <laughs> I'm just sharing the screen. Is it there, Amit? Screen is shared? Yes. yes. Yeah. And she's a 25 year old lady. Uh, low back, again, uh, both low limb radiation. No tingling, occasionally, uh, and waddling gait. Step sign was positive, no deficit. And this is what uh, her MRI was. X-rays. Yeah, the X-rays, sorry. So, uh, the immediate question, is, Dr. Hegde, is that are you thinking about how the screen. extension X-rays are done? Standing versus uh, supine? Oh, always standing. Always standing, okay. A any reason yeah. why not supine? Uh, I think uh, we need to assess uh, the dynamic nature of the of the problem, which is which it is most often. What about the pelvic angles? Do you think they are better off when the patient is uh, vertical versus when the patient is supine? No, it all depends on, uh, I think, the way the x-rays are taken. And if you have a good machine, you can get get go good quality x-rays. Right. So you can have all those parameters, well, uh, measurements done. This it's lady was suffering, yeah, again, this lady was suffering for nearly three to four years and the pains increased in the last two to three months. And it is quite severe pain now. Uh... I don't know if uh, Kern will recollect, but I think in 2017, my fellow presented at ISAS and he got the Leon Wilsey Award 
for uh, our technique of reducing these high grade spondees uh which essentially is what what we have always ad advocated and always followed okay. yeah okay and uh, uh let, well uh, is there any more information that you want to share or yeah we uh, have the uh, x-rays and uh, <coughs> scans yeah the whole spine yeah and this is the mri mm -hmm. and this is the ct scan lovely yeah we we'll are uh, in in general uh, your technique is uh, yes we know sir but uh, would like to uh, understand whether you will uh, fix this in c2 or you will go anterior plus posterior decom and before that the plain question is that this looks like an l4 5 listesis of yes. a high denomination it's you still higher. think it's a dysplastic listesis it is is yep. it common at uh, for l4 a dysplastic listesis it is uh, uh, by i think uh, more than l4 5 of course there is there is a whole lot of things happening at the l4 5 uh, s1 level uh, the it is a lumberized uh, or a sick uh, sick yeah, transitional segment yeah yeah it's a transitional segment yeah <clears throat> so you you would agree you would think that this is not a lytic but it's a or, or neither a, it's a dysplastic lysis uh, i uh, this axial is getting cut here with our images but i think i see uh, th there is a th there is a dysplastic. Not a, uh, there is a, a, a dysplasia there. Yeah. Gun, any insight on this? Gun. Yeah. So just a couple comments, and and I am aware of the um, Sajin winning the award. That was a great paper. If you go back to the MRI. So I look at these uh, out of the, the Marchetti Bartolozzi class classification. So. Uh, um, which was more, and in general terms, I'm not necessarily a deformity surgeon, but when I approach these, I look at, is this low grade or high grade dysplasia? And that to me kind of changes or kind of modifies how I do things. So I think this is high grade dysplasia. It has all the patterns of high grade dysplasia. It has some transitional segment at L5, S1. I really call that L5 level that we're referring to as, as the sacral dome, to be honest. I mean, I think that's truly what that's representing. And then, um, so we have some deformation there. There's clearly a lytic component. That's how these list these. And then she actually, this, this young girl compensates very well. So the reality is you could probably do a bunch of different surgeries on her, at least for the short and, and intermediate term, and she would do well. What we're really talking about in, in our hands and in everyone, the panelists, is what can we do for her that potentially prevents her 10, 15 years from now um, and what parameters are we trying to restore to prevent that? And it becomes really theoretical. So before, many years ago, and I'm not saying I'm so far into practice, but I'm 15 years in, before, what I actually would do in this case, and I don't see the axial cut for the vessels, but I'm a good access surgeon, I would do a, an A-lift first at that first normal disc segment, and I'm going to call that normal disc segment L4-5. You can call it L3-4, but I'll call it L4-5. Yeah. I do an A-lift through that, and then I do a reverse Bowman. I drill from the top of that body, L4, that corner, and I drill into the top of L5 or that transitional segment, and then I put, uh, and I'll do ACL reamers, and I'll put, uh, put grafts, uh, a fibular allograft in, and then I put the A-lift cage and lock them in posteriorly from a, with a, we'll call it an L4 screw and then a transsacral screw going across that five into four body, whatever you want. And I would fix them in sight to, in a, in a, I would say in a posturally reduced fashion. I believe that you'll get some reduction of this just on the table and just relaxation. That's what I used to do. And I, what about and I don't, compression in that approach, Colin? Yeah, so I, I everything relaxes. I fix them first anterior, and then I see how much of the reduction. And then I do uh, I, I used to do a tubular decompression, bilateral complete vasectomies, and tubular decompression, and trace out the roots on the back end. So I did a one of my 
um, operating room nurses, my charge room nurse in our surgery center. I did her that way. She was a 33 year old soccer player. And I, I did her that way. And I've saw her just back for her 10 year follow up and she feels great. Now, interestingly enough, she is developing adjacent level degeneration and okay. some retrolisthesis. So um, I don't have the right answer in that fa fashion. What I've done more recently is more of a shortening, shortening column osteotomy. We'll call it a sacral dome. I call this a sacral dome, sacral dome osteotomy. And I would probably do it depending upon, um, I have a more of a low threshold to always use anterior approaches as well. I just think that um, we just get the best reduction and best alignment, best fusion. So for me, I shorten, I would do a two or three stage procedure in this, in this girl, same day. Um, I would probably go posteriorly do um, the complete facetectomy, complete release of the, that we'll call that transitional level where the stenosis is. I would take down as much of that dome as possible posteriorly, and I would basically loosen up the segment. I would then flip her anteriorly, and I would do my inner body at the first normal segment. We'll call that four or five. And then depending upon how much I can, how much it's loose at the five one segment, I would take off the inferior part of five and do a do an anterior kind of a 360 reduction at that point. Okay. And then um, I would probably still do a reverse Bowman graft across that segment with an ACL reamer. Okay. And then I'd flip back and do posterior fixation percutaneously or some combination of four, five, and one with the transsacral screw. Um, this is a great case that, that I used, um, that I'll use navigation for also. And I just placed the transsacral screws and maximize the lengths into okay. that body on whatever that reduced segment is, but some kind of variation of a short shortening osteotomy, shortening column osteotomy with an anterior fixation. What, what's your opinion about Gaines procedure done for this bone on bone? Yeah, so Gaines procedure, which is the, which is the well, classically described as the L5 vertebral body resection and reduction. So um, Robert Gaines was you know, I think, uh, University of Missouri. I think it's a great procedure. I think it's a lot more work than needs to be done nowadays. I think that we thought we had to remove everything for kind of bony apposition. And I, my, my take on it is, you need to shorten the spine and reduce the spine. I'm sure Sajan will say as much as you need to, to make it mobile, to reduce, to reduce her safely. Um, and if, if that involves the total resection, so be it. I don't think that that's the case here. I actually think that she'll be much more, um, much more loose with like a partial uh, osteotomy of that, that dome of L5 or S1, whatever you want to call it. And I think by the time you go anterior and you can, and that kyphosis is partially corrected and you undercut that slip vertebral body, I think you can, you'll get into some of that, that, that tissue that's kind of holding her up. The, the biggest concern in this individual to me, and I spend the most time, I don't do these frequently. These are not common cases. This is a very challenging case. So kudos to, to how this is being approached. I spend 90% of the comp, I put 90% of my conversation is as follows. I talk about a five root uh, palsy here. And I talk about the severity of a five root dis, uh, dysfunction, because at the end of the day, if I fused her inside to reverse Bowman, a lift and a, and a graft, and she has to deal with the problem of adjacent level in 10 or 15 years, and she doesn't have an L5 root palsy, you know, it's really hard to convince them to do something else. We're almost treating ourselves in some weird fashion of saying, well, we want to get the alignment so perfectly, but she's just asking, can I go run? Can I go do play yeah. soccer? Can I go do whatever it is? And so this is the balancing act. And if I feel, if I fear any trepidation, any fear, any concern, then I'm less likely to do an aggressive reduction and take a risk of a five root uh, dysfunction. Okay. I would like to ask you, this seems like a preemptive attack on your procedure because your procedure <laughs> is likely to uh, cause L5 palsy much more often than uh, the inside effusion. Well, you have to understand, I practice in Chicago, and Chicago is the highest medical malpractice in the United States, which puts it the highest medical practice in the world. The average spine surgeon practicing 15 years in Chicago will have carried 15 medical malpractice suits against him. And those are without policy limits. So $5 million, $10 million per case at exposure. So, you know, it is a, I know it necessarily may be the better option, but it also is what is, you know, the enemy of good sometimes is better. So this person just wants to be functional. 
And none of us can predict what's going to happen in 10 years or 15 years on their adjacent level. Okay. Uh, just uh, to ask uh, Sajan, sir, uh, will you consider in situ by doing delta? The so, so uh, it all boils down to now my over 25 years experience and uh, having worked with Professor Harms and uh, Daniel Chopin, ha having trained with them, we always do it from the back. It is one single approach, no anterior approach. Okay. Reduction from the back, complete reduction. In fact, the correction of the lumbosacral kyphosis and the reduction actually reduces the stretch on the L5 root. Okay. Have had uh, a temporary palsy in our, in our cases in just one of them or two of them, and they have all recovered. Okay. Uh, I believe in a complete reduction. So it all starts from the correct uh, uh, positioning of the patient at the time uh, for the surgery. And also since there is this transitional area uh, of the sacrum where I feel we may not get a good, uh, the, you know, the promontory is not very well formed on the sacrum. So in this particular patient, a young patient with good bone stock, I would still think of using the robot to getting uh, S1 screws and then S2 ALR screws. So okay. that gives me a four point position uh, fixation distally. And then uh, putting one of a temporary screw in L3 or thereabouts, opening up the space where I can then bring back the L5. The L5 pedicles are often very, very laterally placed, and you may have to make a separate incision to get the perfect trajectory into the L5 pedicle. And it is very important that you get it first, first time. And today with the robot, you can do that without any doubt at all. You Sir, any tips for people, those who are not having robot and any osteotomy tips? So after you have done that, after you have opened up the space gradually between, let's call this sacrum and let's call this L5, uh, opened it gradually. After you have done your decompression and you have your L5 roots under good vision, then you start, uh, you may have to take level off the top of the sacrum a little bit to improve the, or help with the reduction of L5 uh, backwards. Once that is done, then you completely clear out the disc and you have to have a good interbody reconstruction. I prefer to put a titanium uh, lordotic cage, a banana cage, which enhances the lordosis. And of course, as you start correcting, your lumbosacral kyphosis gets corrected. And I would, in fact, end my fixation if I have got excellent purchase in the L5 I would not want to go uh, to the level above. So I would just fix that. I would go for a complete reduction or at the most uh, leave the listhesis at uh, grade one at the most. But once I get there, uh, I would create the interbody reconstruction and that's the way I would do it. Dr. Hegde, just a question. What, I mean, what drives you so much to want to do a complete reduction in the balanced spine? If uh, you know the spine uh, was in yeah. I am looking at her MRI here, and I Can do. Switch the X-rays, please. Uh, uh, the the MRI. No, no. Put the MRI. Okay. Put put the MRI. Yeah, I am doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So when you see the MRI, you can see that uh, the compression is quite significant, and posterior decompression doesn't really decompress the, the cord, which is lying in front. The reduction helps in, uh, in, the, in the decompression. So it, it is absolutely important to get the fusion, absolutely important to decompress the neural elements that you reduce it. Okay, okay. Nice. Right, so strong take home messages, but again, there's a blue corner and a red corner here because completely different approaches. Just to wind Very up different. on this, uh, 
uh, Dr. Dr. Hegri, what is your thought about the preemptive fusion at the at the four five that Dr. Kern Singh spoke about? Um, is there a role of doing that in your practice? Doing something, maybe a soft landing at four five or a fusion at four five? Well, let me clarify clarify that. Yeah. My yeah, my reason for the four five approach is because if I only get a partial reduction or any just less than complete reduction of the five one segment. The four five disc allows me to gain access into the vertebral body and then do a reverse Bowman and graft. Because the right. one thing that we know will ruin this 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 girl's life is if in any capacity she gets a non-union, which is why I have a low threshold to going anteriorly. Because no matter what, if solid grafts will unload the screw, if she ends up with the non-union in any capacity in any of these treatments, that revision surgery is brutal. You've either burned pelvic fixation or compromised pelvic fixation. You've burned inner body support. It is a challenging thing. So my goal for her is no matter what I get her to, that four, five, one segment better be solid. Sure. I think it's a great uh, thought process. Yeah. Just to uh, you know, pick on you again, do you have anything seriously against Dr. Hegde's approach aside of the likelihood of an L5 policy? Uh, is there anything else that worries you about that approach, which is rather aggressive compared to yours? Are you, are you scared of picking on Sajan? Is that why you pick on me? Uh, no, I'm going back to is him. That what it, He's okay, a return okay, of serve guy. Yeah. <laughs> just, all right, just making sure. I'm just making sure. Uh, so listen, uh, let, me, let me be very clear that what Sajan's case series is very, is very impressive. I don't profess to be as good technically in this area as Sajan. So I'm approaching this as somebody who – who has, you know, maybe a, an alternative skill set in this. And I look at it as, I don't believe I am good enough. And I, I always kind of figure out my plan based upon, like, what do I think I can get to? I don't believe I can get to a complete reduction safely. So if I can't get to a complete reduction safely, I have to start figuring out maximizing my fusion potentials and what can I get her to? So if I could do what Sajin does, I would do it. I have no problem with doing it. I have a genuine concern on this case, and we're always creatures of our own past experience. One of my partners, very famous surgeon, um, did this case, and the young girl, 17-year-old, ended up with an L5 root palsy, complete bilateral. And he did it. I was there. He did a phenomenal case. And he had an expert at the time, one of the big, well-known deformity surgeons in California, Dave Bradford, who was a well-known uh, spine surgeon, testify against him. That he said it was a violation of standard of care with the reduction maneuver. So my my we are we are also creatures of our environment as well. So I think that Sajin has a, a vast experience in this. I just kind of say, what are the options I can do? And I just talked about the generalized population that may be listening to this. I can do a decompression. That I can do. I think I can do it as well as Sajin. I can do that decompression. So safely do that first. That's the first thing. Number two. I can dabble in doing a sacral dome osteotomy or removing some posterior segments as much as I can. Number three, I can then evaluate how much it's reduced. And if it's favorable, I can do a staged anterior approach and get me the additional reduction that Sajin could get all posteriorly. We could complicate this and we could say, you know what? You could put pedicle screws into the L1 pedicle and start distracting with the external fixators. People talk about that as well, distracting longitudinally because that's more in line. There are more upper level kind of high-end skills and nuances that Sajin's not describing here, but I'm approaching it from a general surgeon, like a general spine surgeon, the complexity of this case, I have to make sure I get whatever reduction I can safely in a solid fusion bed. Great. You fought your case well, Dr. Gernsing. Do what works best in your hand. So truth and dare moment for Dr. Hegde. Uh, cross your heart and hope to die. How many L5 policies in your practice so far? Uh, we would, I would have to uh, look at my, but actually very, very, very few and all of them recovered. None of any other complications like implant back out, implant failures, screws failing? We had uh, one screw uh, malplacement, which we had to correct. And uh, that's about it. We had to take her back to the OR, reposition the screws. Uh, we now have more than 25 years on some of our old cases. These were done in late 90s, late wow. 90s with the interbody fusion, you know? Right. So, yeah. So, and it's then, also, 
It's only going to cut you off, Sajid, but in this country, it's also unusual to see this grade of listhesis anymore since it's tracked and identified so early now and Correct. people are more aggressive. Yes. So you, we see less of this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Shailesh, any uh, closing comments on this case? No, I think uh, we also follow uh, what Dr. Egre uh, prefers. Uh, our uh, always thinking is how we do a good decompression, uh, how good releases we can do. And normally we prefer to do distraction and uh, reducing this from all posterior. And we have, uh, uh, you know, in this I can just uh, show this is what was done. And uh, here we are lucky to get a good distraction. We have to give time. And good releases. Dr. Hegde, if there's one thing you would have done better than Dr. Hargaukar, what would it have been in this case? Uh, I think they have, uh, Sailesh has done a great job, but I, uh, I would have uh, enhanced uh, fixation. I, I think we have not discussed this uh, with, uh, with the Sanchiti group. But uh, this is what has come, come into my mind, that uh, the sacrum is a little too short, and I'm not sure if it can hold, uh, take all the stresses. I would have announced either with the screw at S2 level, okay. level, which looks more like the sacrum, to help uh, get a good fixation distally, or done an S2 LR screw. So more, more fixation on the south side. Uh, Dr. Singh, yes. do you have a take on this? Anything you would have first done differently the, if you were stuck in this procedure? Well, no, first of all, great. I mean, amazing reduction. So, I mean, it's, that's the, um, I mean, that's a testament to the skill set here. Uh, the, the challenges on this, is, and I agree with Sajin about fixation. I'm always concerned about these uh, transitional level, short segment fixations or short length fixations. The, the challenge also becomes going distally. Look how, we don't have this in this country, but look at our skin prominence to that. I mean, I can't imagine any hardware that's not going to be prominent, I'll get worried about breakdown. You see, it's just close to the fascial edge. So, um, you know, we have some some lower profile instrumentation that we could probably utilize. This is clearly done, you know, before, but uh, otherwise, I do get concerned about fixation inferiorly uh, because such a high stress, high shear stress with that reduction. Right. Okay. Awesome. Thank can you. we move to the next case? Yeah, we move to the next case. Uh, Abhay, over to you. So uh, this is an urban lad who's uh, an IT professional, and this is all that we have on the, all the data on one slide. Uh, he's a young guy who likes to gym, and uh, over time he's busted his uh, lumbar spine, and this is what it is: uh, progressive back pain and uh, equal to his uh, bilateral claudication. And he's again had multiple injections. He's had physical therapy. He's very keen to go back to the gym. Uh, Kern, what do you think you want to offer him? So this is, I think, something that Kern sees uh, every day in his practice. More commonly, yeah, sure. Yes. Sure. Um, there, there you go, Kern. You, Sajan has I'm batted this off to you again. <laughs> First of all, uh, there's two cases. I'm 0 for 2 right now. I'm losing on both these cases. So I just want to, I want to start off with a hit here. So um, to, to me, this is a, this is very similar to the other individual. I mean, this is an individual that is. Uh, you know, has in interesting disc herniations, large central component, but actually a lot of it's subarticular. I think what you're trying to, to demonstrate here. So subarticular, foraminal. <laughs> I really think the pathology is probably that, there's this level five, four, three. What about that, instability? Two, three. Are you concerned about the retrolysis and uh, the uh, trans translational instability? Zero. No worries. Zero concern. Right. Zero. I used to be concerned. I don't, I'm not concerned about it. I just I think that a lot of it, it's amazing how much the spine, quote unquote, realized with thorough decompressions it is actually real. And that means so in this, this approach, this is a this is a challenging decompression because I think that, you know, the the proximal level L23, the interpedicular facet, the interpedicular distance is narrow and that facet, it's always challenging to go either a midline or a tubular approach in that case, because you ultimately end up resecting a large portion of the facet joint to get the subarticular component. Um, so it becomes very challenging to do an adequate decompression and a discectomy without destabilizing that segment. I just think that's a challenge in it. And that's the biggest challenge here. It's a large disc herniation here. 
a large central component that goes all the way under the undersurface of the uh, articular process. But it also lends itself, this is the perfect case for, endo and for endoscopy. This is a transferaminal, this is transferaminal decompression every day for me. This is, this is the patient that um, is the ideal case. It's proximal level, no issues with the crest. Um, and it's just the one that prevents any instability. So for me, this is a multi-level, maybe two-level transframal decompression. And how long will it take you to do this? So it, it does take time to do a transframal decompression. <laughs> There's no, it's, so I don't usually, I put one day where I do endoscope cases and I just do them back and forth because the time to set up is painful. It's a painful procedure. I'm not one of those guys who say, oh my God, it's the sexiest thing. It's not like driving a Ferrari or something like it. it's. It is, it is like driving a what's that car? That Maruti is that what they call it? <laughs> or the, or the, it's 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 or Ambassador. That's what it is. It's not it's Ambassador, not enjoyable. More like so, it, yeah. So I think that for the L two three level, that will take me around forty five minutes to an hour to decompress transferaminally. I think that additional levels are about thirty minutes or so, but it's going right. to take about two hours to do three levels. Right. That sounds extremely attractive, Dr. Hignik. Can you buy that procedure? I, I, to I totally buy it. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I'm not very, uh, very uh, thrilled because uh, in my skill set, I'm not an endoscopy, endoscopy surgeon. So, and I know that uh, it, it is a case like this where uh, the decompression endoscopic decompressions would work very, very well. Because what I would have to, uh, to offer for him is <clears throat> should he undergo de uh, endoscopic decompression and come back with pain? Because then my solutions will be more clear. Yeah. No, you know, Saj, your, your point is actually valid. So the reason I became an endoscopic surgeon is not because I believe that a L45 or L5S1 endoscope versus a tube is any better. There's zero difference. Anyone that tells you that is that's just garbage. There's zero difference. There's zero difference in recovery. There's zero difference in how fast they get off the operating room table. Zero difference in how far they leave. The sole reason that I adopted endoscopy is select. It's for cases like this. It's for cases in your the the prior case that you showed that are challenging to do either via traditional decompression or a tubular decompression. For me in the past, to get to that subarticular L2-3 level, to get out to the foramen, it's a, I would have done T-lift, lateral, and then facetectomy decompression, perk, something of that combination to address this. But the endoscope opens up uh, a treatment algorithm or paradigm that's not attainable a lot of times with these subarticular foramenal HMPs or large central HMPs that you can't get to safely. Right, Sajan, given that you don't have the endoscopy skill set, what are you going to offer her? So, uh, 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 in in our setup, if such a patient patient can, what is his uh, BMI? Whose patient is it? It's a young guy. He's on your top left. Screen. Yeah, but he's oh, he's very slim. Yeah, he's, slim and young guy, fit guy. Fit guy. Yeah. Uh, it all depends on the severity of his uh, complaints, and if he's truly extremely disabled. In my setup, I would offer him a two-level fusion with, with a transition at the top. But before that, I would do, in my setup, we do what is called as a, as a CT Milo, uh, where we try to assess where, which levels are the real, uh, uh, the, the levels where there is compression and, uh, and the, 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 the degree of contribution from each level. So, for example, if the L3-4, though here it seems like extremely narrowed, but if it is on a CT Milo, it's filling well, and only at the uh, lower two levels uh, there is compression, then I would prefer to do a, uh, uh, a TLF at that level I mean, uh, using the robot MIS type and uh, a transition uh, fixation at the level above so that... Uh, you know, because the way he is degenerating, it's very likely uh, in the next 10 years, he would show degeneration at the levels above. Right. So multiple questions op open up here vis-a-vis -vis what Dr. Kern Singh said. So do you, are you going to fuse him because you think he's unstable? Do you think this is an unstable spine? 
Well, uh, he has significant progressive back pain, and he has retrolysis, which is quite mobile on uh, uh, dynamic X-rays. Yes, and he has lost this kite at every level, and uh, though he doesn't have deformity, he's uh, he's got a normal lordosis. So, but I would, I, but I think his discites are reduced. I would like to restore them. So unstable or not unstable? Uh, uh, I, if his back pain and leg pain are worse on standing, walking, I think there is there must be an element of uh, instability. The other question is, what does Milo offer you more than an MRI scan? So it is complementary. It's what uh, what additional information. We have found in a study that we have done that uh, what sometimes is not available on a, on an MRI or there is confusion about multiple levels. The CT Milo helps you to narrow down on the on the disease level. And does it require yeah. a lot of obtuse thinking so, to figure out a CT Milo? Not really. Right. Yes, sir. I want to ask both of them. Uh, what are what is the criteria for auto stabilization in these kind of cases? No, but Kern wanted to ask something. Uh, Silesh, let yeah. him. Start. Yeah, no, no. I'll, I'll address it also. But first of all, the power of how many participants you have. Let me just tell you an anecdote. So my wife just sent me a text message that her good friend is an internist here in Chicago, whose cousin is a spine surgeon in India. Is watching this. So he texted her cousin who texted my wife, who texted me a screenshot. So, I mean, you guys have a lot of followers on this. So kudos to you. That's very impressive. Um, international, so, uh, it's international. Yeah, no, definitely, yeah. definitely. Number, yeah. number two, let's be very clear. Everyone is being very politically correct here. This is the hardest patient to take care of in your degenerative exactly. practice. Exactly, exactly. So this is, the yeah. one, this is the one you don't want to have because you have someone who yeah. has multi-level discogenic low back pain. You Correct. can make all the subtleties and arguments that this is instability. It's not instability. This is not a scoliosis. It's not a solisthesis that we know how to treat. And this is multi-level disease in a, in, a, um, in a young active individual. And let's also be very clear. If you guys had this, every single one of you would come and get an endoscopic decompression first. Absolutely. That is your treatment. It's no debate. Now, the real debate is, in a case we may not be endoscopically proficient, what are you going to do? And I'm not saying that I'm an endoscopic expert. So looking at this from Sajan's perspective, I also would get a myelogram CT. And the reason I get a myelogram CT is, is because Sajan is trying to limit the amount of damage he does to this individual and to focus his treatment. So what he's really saying is, you know what, where the die flow is the most severe, where the cutoff is the most severe, I'm gonna treat this individual at that level give him enough improvement, 60, 70, 80% improvement, that he's happy enough that he can function. So I don't have to do a justification of a multi-level fusion surgery on an active 40-year-old who we all know won't be happy with his outcome no matter what you do. Yeah, so a quick question to Kern and Sajan with both your respective procedures. Are you happy to, for him to go back to the gym the way he'd like to? Absolutely. Sajan? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, the second question is that I had posted him for a Dinesis procedure. Do you have any thought, thoughts on that? Uh, I, would like Kern to, uh, I would like Kern to... I, I, I went through that uh, interspinous uh, trip for a while. And... Not interspinous. It's a pedicle-based... No. Um, okay. yeah. Oh, the so Dinesis. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. okay, okay. Okay, right. okay. Interesting. So interesting yeah. that you mentioned Dinesis because Dinesis, Zimmer Biomeds in this country... It was uh, introduced soft, kind of a soft stabilization improvement for uh, interbodies, allowed the inner body to load share, completely fell out of this country. Almost no sales of Dinesis in the country, zero. And in fact, if you probably did this in this country, someone would probably testify you against you for medical malpractice. But that's not the case. I think it's so far extreme. Dinesis now has been used for tethering. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a form of tether to come back. Uh, in some capacities. It's a really interesting concept. What you're basically saying is that, at least as I interpret Abe, is that at the end of the day, this person needs something in between a decompression, but not a full fusion. He needs Absolutely. something where he can allow some movement of movement and that he can avoid multiple levels becoming symptomatic. I think it's an interesting concept. I have no experience on it, but- Just, it just for completion is, uh, he's actually eight years post-op after Dinesis. 
and he's very active in yeah he's a fat big guy uh, over to you dr hadgaukar yeah uh, thank you abhay maybe the next uh, two cases you can present shailesh yeah is a great discussion and lot of uh, learning points uh, we'll go quickly on this uh, cases now a 70 year old active businessman he was uh, mildly obese uh, lumbar decompression was done uh, 3 years back he, he presented uh, to us with back pain radiating to thigh anteriorly unable to get up and stand pain was not settling intact neurology and uh, this is uh, what the x ray was yes uh, quick comment from sir so a well done surgery sajan sorry is this a well done operation uh what were his symptoms prior to surgery he had a stenosis and uh, uh it uh, probably a degenerative lysthesis uh you have his pre op records but do you think this is technically a well done no, no, abroad yeah uh, this is what we used to do in the uh, in the late 90s i don't do it anymore simply because uh, they they tend to develop some problems or the other this seems to have held up quite well it's I, how many 3 years post operative 3 years post op yeah yeah so we it's seen back the implants the time. implants seem to be holding he has not done any interbody fusion the sagittal alignment seems to be reasonably okay so everything seems to be good uh if somebody did this i would say it's okay i yeah. i would say I would... you okay with the lordosis kern are you okay with this lordosis at the end of the so, day so so uh, this is my this is my philosophy as far as when i deal with my you know my residents or fellows or anyone who comes to see me as an mis spine surgeon the worst thing i can do is to fuse someone flat from 4 to 1 because everything every problem in life in spine surgery deals with fusions flat from 4 to 1 you better have lordosis from 4 to 1 If you don't have lordosis at four to one, you will inevitably see two, three years, two, three years, two, three years, and it's just adjacent level, adjacent level. So, But, if I'm going to be brutally, brutally critiquing this, I would say this is like Sajan was saying: this is not a bad surgery if this was done 15, 20 years ago before we understood pelvic parameters. But if you look at this, the inner body graft is not inducing any lordosis, and it's really hard technically to get lordosis from a TLF unless you're very skillful. In general, TLF is a distracting or kyphosing procedure. and then the rest is fused in situ so the top end plate of four and the s1 end plate you maybe have 10 degrees of lordosis at most in the most in, you have a rod that looks lordotic but that's just because the tulip heads are just either put more dorsal or ventral actually, but this is a this is iatrogenic flat back this is what i just did actually on friday where i did an anterior column resection an acr i did an acr um to to get 30 degrees of lordosis above the top and give the chance so this person doesn't have to end up with the pedicle subtraction osteotomy 10 or 15 years down the road this person is going to domino back and forth with the jason level problems now okay i'll just go through and this is the mr was a large disc at l23 what next any axial cut shailesh you see the facets at, uh, yeah we have or any dynamic x rays maybe are any of you at all interested in dynamic x rays here no not really i am not i i would not do dynamic x ray i are you uh, sajan are you thinking fusion or decompression l23 large disc uh i i i i I was just uh, I was just thinking of uh, of posing the question to Khan that this seems <laughs> like a good case where he would consider doing an endoscopic decompression and leave him alone and maybe he will be all right and forget about his uh, sagittal parameters with which he has lived for so long uh, would that be a way to go. large disc a yeah, two three higher level disc yeah this is a i had seen this previously shalesh has shown it to me i said endoscopic case all day every day for this this is a perfect decompression now i'm going to temper that with saying that is not going to solve this patient's long term problems it is going to get you another couple of years before this person bounces <laughs> back again 
and they will bounce back. So if you go back to the x-ray for me, Shalish. Yeah. This is somebody, this is a case almost not as bad as what I just posted. I just posted on LinkedIn. This is, this is it. I just literally posted on Friday. I just did this yesterday. I saw this that, uh, Khan. Very, very yeah. well done. Very well done. Congratulations. Thank you. So this to me is uh, a lateral approach, resection of the ALL, and a 30-degree hyperlordotic cage. And I would do a mini open bilateral complete facetectomy. And because the fusion, I get make sure the CT scan shows the fusion is solid below. I would do a one or two level construct just there going down, locking it inferiorly, cutting the rod with the metal cutting burr. Okay. Make it a very limited exposure posteriorly. Okay. But if, if I could get 30 degrees at that level L23, then I can, because she, this person is relatively well balanced, remarkably so. They're compensating very well. But I think whatever you do to L23, that determines this person for the next 5, 10, 15 years, how quickly they're going to bounce back. And so I really would hyperlordose them and do an anterior column resection here. Okay, okay, okay. What about you, sir, Sajan, sir? Uh, we are just beginning to do OLIFs and uh, anterior column work. We have not done any anterior column resections. Uh, in this case, I would do, I would go the good old way. Uh, I would accept uh, his uh, poor sagittal parameters and uh, deal with the, the upper level. So I may uh, cut the rods at a level above, okay. put screws at the, for the segment above, uh, do the decompression, try to get as much lordosis from the back. I know okay. I agree with Kern. You, you can do only so much from the back, but I've been doing it for a while. And that's what I would do for our patients. Uh, I know- no, no, I agree with you, Sajjan. I don't want to diminish what you're doing, but what you're really espousing is doing a cantilever T-lift. And I think that that's the case. And I think that's a good, I think that's a great procedure to do. And I think it's a, it's, it, it will, what you're trying to say is the same thing as what I'm saying. Whatever you do here, you better get as much lordosis as you can in the best procedure you can. And what I oftentimes see here is people go in and they do the worst thing. They go in and do a lateral and there's no lordosis on it. Or they do a standard T-lift and they get no compression lordosis. And all they do is basically kick the domino down the line. And so they fuse again the level above and it's still flat. So whatever you're going to do, get lordosis. So I agree with you. Okay. Okay. So uh, I think uh, great learning and uh, the plan will be uh, decompression uh, at the level above. You can do either way as uh, Dr. Kern Singh is talking or uh, Sajan sir is uh, telling us. I think uh, uh, traditionally we used to do the L23 decompression facetectomy and uh, advancing the levels, uh, but various ways to skin a cat. I'll go to the next case, Kern. These cases start becoming above my pay grade. I saw some of this complexity of these cases. This is <laughs> yeah. this yeah. is what I call a junior partner. I don't. I have to. I have to. Uh, yeah, nine year old. This is very challenging. Yeah, nine year old boy uh, road traffic and uh, lost the ball and bladder, and uh, we can see that there is the sacral fracture overriding uh, S two. Or S3 and uh, bladder retention, we can see. Yeah. How will you approach this? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what Sajan has done for me, which is, you know, I'm gonna defer to Sajan first and then give my answer <laughs> because I'm, I am the first to admit that, first of all, pediatric injuries for me are. I don't deal with pediatrics. Okay. I can talk okay. to you about adult treatment parameters in this, but let me, I'll just say for the generalist, because I'm a generalist as a spine surgeon. Okay. Challenging things with pediatric surgery from a generalist perspective, anatomy is still very infantile. It's not fully developed in this, in this individual. And whatever you do in this individual, you are talking about changing them forever in their life, right? And, and so those are things that we underestimate when we do adult deformity or adult fractures. That's an important point, number one. Okay. And number two, pro the fixation changes, or if you do any fixation, all those maneuvers that we're traditionally used to for adult 
anatomy completely changed. So that's why this makes it such a challenging case of balancing a neurological deficit and screwing over a young kid for the rest of their life. So with yeah, that I being said, I, I will defer to Sajan on this one first. Okay, yes, Sajan, sir. Well, this was going to be a furious uh, game of uh, you first and... <laughs> Hot potato. <laughs> <laughs> Simply because, A, forget about adults, uh, uh, for, forget about pediatric, even in adults, <clears throat> at least in our setup, we do not see many sacral fractures. Yeah. So I would have to go back and re relearn a lot of, lot about sacral fractures before I even start thinking about how I would handle this child. Having said that, I would like a, a beautiful 3D recon CT, uh, which we we have now. I, I I'm told one of the best machines in the country. So I would like to have a beautiful understanding, and maybe recreate. Uh, 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 th uh, what is that 3D model, uh, which uh, which they uh, recreate, and then I try to understand how what I can do to realign, and do the minimum fixation uh, okay. uh, to hold it together because healing is not a problem in the child. Yeah, yeah. Sajid, can we break down this question into easier lots? Do you think this is an unstable fracture? Uh, the the level at which the sacrum is broken, do you think is doing some and harm? Six to seven the days old. This was six seven days old uh, when he was referred to us. I mean, the fracture is obviously unstable, but do you think it's causing harm to the stability of the pelvis? I'm just showing no, the MR. It is not. So, uh, are you very very keen to do some kind of a realignment fixation, or are you happy to do a decompression alone? I I don't mind doing just a just a, I don't mind doing just a decompression. Also, what are you thinking of when you think of fixation? Where do you think your screws are going to go here since the pelvis is no longer going to be your friend? Oh, absolutely. So I want a, I want a clay, I, mean, I want a, that model in my hand to understand where the fracture lines run, where the displacement is, before I plan where I'm going to put the screws, for sure. Yeah, and what kind of what kind of implants I can I can use to hold these fragments in place. Should I need to do that? Shailesh, what do you, uh, can you tell us what you did? Yeah. Uh, a very rare and interesting injury. That's what Yeah, I mean. it's a, yeah this, is very, this is very challenging. I, I'm yeah. saying this is, like I said, above my pay grade. This was the MR and we discussed with our trauma team. We are a very good department of trauma and <laughs> we jointly discussed plan for this. And we planned for a reduction. And uh, if the reduction, because of the bladder was involved, as we see, uh, and... Uh, we uh, continued with a constant traction for a couple of minutes uh, and we checked under the C-arm. That time uh, we didn't have the, the O-arm, this is a couple of years back. And uh, we decompressed the spine. It was not, the reduction was not coming. Uh, it was going, falling back uh, where it was. Then we open, uh, reduced, we decompressed it and we uh, fixed with the mini plates. Luckily, uh, under traction, we had to fix this uh, one plate at a time and uh, we were lucky to get a, a very uh, good alignment uh, and decompression in this. This was uh, the follow-up and this is how the X-ray looked. We were very lucky to get a very good uh, reduction here. And, and the these plate plates held on for some days? Yeah, yeah, now it is two and a half, three years follow-up. This is uh, uh, absolutely, the child is doing uh, fantastic. Uh, uh, bladder yeah. is controlled. Yeah, bladder is uh, completely come back in three months' time. And he's running, he's doing all the activities of daily life. Would, would you consider removing those implants? We, 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 we are planning to because uh, this, uh, now this, we were planning to take it out after two years. Just before the lockdown, it was two years. So let's see, because uh, now we don't need to keep the place as the child is growing. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, great. I mean, great reduction, great case. I mean, I wouldn't even know how to approach it. Yeah. I have to, I'd have to go on to, to, to Wikipedia or something to look this up. <laughs> <laughs> what this definitely needs is a shortening and a good decompression. I think that's the... That's yeah, yeah. The decompression helped and because of the decompression, we could distract. We use a couple of maneuvers, the traction and we use the small uh, the screw, uh, this uh, this shine spins to uh, pull the joystick lower, yeah joysticking the lower fragment and it was quite challenging it took around two hours for the reduction thing but we were lucky when we got that 
reduction and the reduction came with the plates the mini plates it didn't come without so that was the challenge we were lucky over to you am i next yeah yeah so uh, we are 69 minutes into this uh, round and the round is getting pretty long so let's uh, you know move to a you know a different scenario so this is an adolescent girl with uh, you know who's come presents with deformity and she does talk about pain in the legs but she's walking around and she's not uh, disabled in that sense this is her clinical profile that's the x ray and um, these are the bending x rays uh, sajan again this is your baby so uh, we we'll, you know we're going to hit at your door first uh, are you uh, you know happy with what you have and are you going to plan this uh, for her or uh, so i always uh, tell a bai that uh, i always uh, assess these children with the stretch uh, traction film right and uh, i like my traction films i mean in terms of levels uh, to help in to know flexibility to how the uh, lower end of the deformity behaves how it aligns itself and uh, you know so you know what levels to fix everything you, you get a good idea on any other uh, investigation would you want uh, of course the one the traction x ray anything else uh, uh, I mean, given that the concave bending is uh, the, the lower curve is straightening up completely. In fact, yes, going the yes, other way. Yes, that's very good. Yes. Yeah. Any uh, other investigation? Uh, uh, how old is the girl? Thirteen. Thirteen. Okay. And Kern, you can, you're free to talk. Also. Yeah, Kern, no, Kern, I was just, I was just more curious. The learning point on the what what is the what what do you find most important about the traction films? That's that to me is the you know that's something we get routinely here. What's the What's the most important point for the traction film? What are you gleaning from that, Sajan? Uh, so uh, it tells me how the spine would behave once we have corrected it, and it would also tell me what my distal uh, lower uh, limit of fixation will be, as well as the proximal level. It uh, it helps me in that. So so for example, if this I know in the bent films we can already make out. but sometimes that additional information is useful in your so plan. what would be what would be your assessment in this individual right now like or you know and and then potentially how would the traction film have changed that like if you just had these films here cuz I, i don't i'm not familiar with traction films we don't necessarily routinely get those in the united states for this particular case the information that is available here is good enough for me to make the decisions Okay. So, uh, what would that be your decision? Uh, about the about the fixation. Uh, so, roughly what so, levels? So, so I am. Do you want an MRI scan at all? Yes, of course. That is a given. What about a lateral uh, X-ray? Of course, that's a given. Right. Right. So, yeah. just uh, that's the uh, lateral that's X-ray. A lateral X-ray and an MRI is uh, part of the. the uh, pre operative protocol so so far so good everyone yeah so yeah. here's the kicker our uh, registrar thought there was something wrong so um, they got a you know more uh, focused cone down view of the lateral x ray and she has she seems to have a very high grade spondy at l5 spondy oh yeah. okay so yeah. So we'd so, almost uh, planned her levels, and uh, we found this out. Okay, this is absolutely amazing. So uh, in our study, I I I I, I wish I, I had time to go back to it. We had a significant number of patients presenting with what looked like AIS deformity and a spondy, a high grade spondy. So the high grade spondy now. changes everything you have to treat the spondy first yes the in the regular way like i said you have to reduce it that correction often helps correct uh, spontaneously correct the deformity if okay. it is not then it becomes a different story how much time will to you me, to for... me yeah not a hegde you know gun is saying something yeah Khan, No, no, I don't mean to interrupt. But to me, the red flag I was going to say earlier was, you said 
pain in the legs. That's not classic for AIS. When someone tells me pain in the legs, I look for something else besides the scoliosis in the, oh, in the adolescent. And that to me, that's why it felt like a loaded question. And that's why I was trying to get at maybe traction film. I was missing something, but pain in the legs to me is almost when I see these people or these kids, it's like, there's always like a, a list, a listhesis or lytic lysis at five one. That is the cult, culprit. And I, and I agree wholeheartedly with Saj, what Sajin just said, treat the five one first. And it's remarkable how much they just improve and their balance improves after the treatment of the, of the, the thesis. Yeah. Right. So uh, Sajan, just a couple of questions that are, are there any situations where the curve has now gone out of line with the spondy reduction, helping the curve. And I don't mean to say leave the spondy alone, but the patient is obviously asking me, if you do my spondy now, do you think I need to do the scoli later? So yeah, you uh, because in uh, you know in our discussion groups uh, there are you know a couple of things that come across. I just wanted your insight on uh, you know is there a cutoff after which you feel the curve will need a separate treatment and the spondy will uh, you know precede that? In this particular in this particular case, we haven't had any occasion where we treated the spondy and had to do the the scoliosis. But in this particular case, I suspect after you have done the L5-S1 correction, you may still have to offer her uh, scoliosis correction. We will then discuss about what we will do for the scoliosis. So why, uh, why do you think in this case, the scoliosis may come up for surgery later? Because uh, the, 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 the pattern of the scoliosis that I am seeing falls into a more classic AIS pattern. Uh, the, 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 the pattern of uh, deformity that I see with the high-grade spondies is one of... Uh, atypical. atypical curve. Yes, atypical curve. Yeah. What about the age of the patient? Does that have any bearing to that thought process? How old is she? She's 13. You think, uh, is there a cutoff age after which you feel the scoliosis is now out of hand? No. Uh, no you know, I'm going to interject here. I think that a lot, yeah. oftentimes in these people, it's that they've been told repeatedly through multiple treating providers that their problem is the scoliosis. You then see them and then you determine a different pathology to be their problem. Psychologically, they're still fixated on the scoliosis. So the way I handle these people, and that may be, and that's just because of years of being told. And it's the most, you can't tell somebody, a patient, that it's the listhesis that's the problem which they can't physically see, but they can see the hump on their back you know, and, and they, it's, it's a really challenging situation. So Absolutely. the way I usually deal with these is I always tell them we may treat the scoliosis. Absolutely. Let's treat this one first. And then after a year or so or two, because it's not going to rapidly right. progress. Yes. Let's see. And almost all of them have gone on to move on to normal activities. And they're like, yeah, I feel too good. I don't even want to deal with the scoliosis. I'm okay. Yeah, I just want to ask you, how much time will you wait? Uh, you do the number L5S1, you decompress, fix it. And how much time would you like to wait for uh, this deformity? I think, as correct say, or I, I, I think as Kern says, you can wait a year. One year. Yeah. Or maybe more. She's postmenarchal. She's postmenarchal, I think, right? Yeah. On the, uh, so yeah, she's so not going to progress too much on okay. her deformity. While, of course, you will see her at uh, at six months and see if the curve is jumping out of uh, out of control. If it is, then you have to have a discussion. How, how much? Yeah. How much percent you feel, Kern? This will not need another surgery in your experience. So I'm going to lose the experience because I'm only 15 and Sajan's 25. So I always lose that uh, that argument. So with my, I'm going to say, my here's my theory. I don't believe this curve is going to rapidly progress. I just don't see that. It's post monarchal I think her problem is her ismic, her spondylolisthesis at five one. The real question is, um, is it going to be fixated onto the point that she wants to address it? So I, I just tell people it's relative. You're going to, like Sajan said, you're going to see them at six months, X-rays. You're going to see them at one year, X-ray. At that point, if I see no progression, then I'll see them back again in a year. I don't, you're not losing anything. So I don't have a number for you, except that time is your friend, not your enemy. Right. So uh, the other question, Sajan, is that does this make a strong case for reduction vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Kern's procedure? Oh, absolutely. 
I stand by what I say. Kern, do you agree that, that here yes. you would make special efforts to reduce I, the spondy or do you I, think I, stabilizing I, I, it I, I, I think once the pandemic is over, we will get Kern to come over when uh, flights are... <laughs> and uh, hopefully, we will do some endoscopic work where we, he will teach us what to do. And then we will teach him how to reduce a good spondy. <laughs> Listen, I, every time I go to India, I, I always tell people I learn more than I ever teach. So it, to me, it's always a privilege. It's always a, it's always a blessing. I, I, I will say this. This is a different animal than the other high, the higher grade. I yes. absolutely would get this reduced. This is, I, don't, I don't have the fear of a five root palsy on this one. So I would make every attempt to do what Sajan has described so well and get that reduced. Right. So in our, our group, we strongly believe that this will correct itself. She had come from Assam and we have very uh, a very early follow-up, but uh, she's come from Assam. So coming back again, Assam is farther than Bangladesh. So coming back yeah. again and again is a big problem, but I kind of, uh, you know, sold, sold the white elephant to her and I said, this is, you don't need scoliosis surgery and she's been sending pictures. It's just three months old, It'll but we've had, uh, you know, half a dozen cases uh, with my boss, Dr. Bhojraj before with uh, significant uh, curved denominations of uh, people who are just perimenarchal and they've all sorted out and they've not needed scoliosis surgery. There are some other Arnold Chiari syndromes uh, which have gone the same way and some deep dirings that have gone the same way. So uh, it's interesting just to get insights from everybody else. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Shailesh, can you take over for the next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, because we have kept uh, special cases as uh, Dr. Hegde and Dr. Singh was... Supposed to be here. Oh, God. <laughs> because these, these are, are cases. This is a case you don't see in the United States. This is why we always come to meetings and we see what you guys are doing because we just, <laughs> unless you're Larry Lenke, you don't see this case. Okay. He's a 14 year old uh, <laughs> with significant thoracolumbar kyphosis. We can see that almost vertical vertebral body. Yeah. She's severe comp, but patient was nil neuro and again, difficulty to lie on the back. Some early symptoms of mild weakness in the one leg. No bladder, nothing. No, no bladder, bladder, nothing. Early no bladder nothing. Because it's well below the cord level. So you don't, yeah, you don't expect yeah, yeah. upper motor yeah. signs. But, um, this is the x-ray. This is the scanogram. Yes, Sergeant. Isn't that, isn't that isn't that AP amazing that you see a uh, you see the uh, the vertebral body on fast view like yeah, that's really crazy. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So amazing. Uh, again, for all these, I love to get a very high quality, high resolution CT scan. Yes, sir. I can see there is a block vertebrae below the hemi vertebrae. Yeah, there is a block vertebrae there with the two. Two, uh, two pedicles uh, in it, and then you have the block. Yeah. Do you think this is congenital or do you think this is uh, tuberculosis, heel tuberculosis? I was about to uh, say tuberculosis. Is this tuberculosis? Sajan? I think it is congenital. Is there a, any history of tuberculosis? No, no, no. I said no history. Yeah. But aren't there tons of guys who don't give a history, but they just... Yeah, but this. yeah, it is a possibility. This is either that or... It just looks like uh, that, that whole fusion mass, it looks like it's just, as opposed to distinct block vertebrae or hemivertebrae, it looks more like a burnt out... It, yeah, yeah, you don't see product. anything practically because... And it's a pure kyphosis with no scoliosis, which is again... A no scoliosis. Or yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, agreed. So, uh, of course, uh, the high resolution CT, and I like to get that mo uh, that model made up so that I know exactly what I'm dealing with. And uh, well, we have the robot, so why not use it to so that uh, the headache for putting these screws is quickly taken care of. I would fix uh, four, three. And uh, about the hemi vertebrae, about three levels. And okay. then, uh, with the robot, I would get it done in record time. Once I have done that, uh, do all. You just you just pro you just proclaimed yourself the world record holder with record time. You just gave it the title to yourself, there, Sajan. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't like that. No, 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 no. Here's what I would like to ask you a question, Sajjan. I actually yeah. would use a robot, and I've used a robot in osteotomy cases, and I don't yes. use the robot for screw plates. I actually use the robot to place pins for my cuts. So I draw out, so I place the pins, yes. and that way it makes my osteotomy cuts very quick. Yes, and that helps you to plan your uh, uh, VCR, uh, P, I mean, uh, what is that, PSO from the back. I think a PSO should do with the pedicle. You Do you need VCR, sir? Well, uh, you can call it a VCR if you want. Uh, yeah, to me, it's like a fusion mass VCR resection. I would make the markers with the with either navigation or robotic. I usually place the markers in the pins, and I take the burr and I cut down on the pins very quickly. Yes. So it makes it very, very quick. Very and quick. in fact, I actually that's how I do PSOs now. I just place it yes. with the with some kind of guidance, and then I just literally cut down on the pins, and it's exactly. my tumor how, how partner. Much, how much chance of percentage of neurological worsening you explain to the patient, Sergeant? So this is, this is done under uh, neuromonitoring, okay. and it, mainly a compressive surgery. Okay. Unless you retract very vigorously on the neural elements, since you'll be working mostly on the, on the lateral areas, the chances are not very high. And also, I uh, I don't know about Kern, but I love to use the the ultrasonic scalpel to make. Mm -hmm. my yeah, this is probably yes. one case I would I would use that absolutely. Yes. Yes, Dr. Nene, uh, your experience? Yeah, I mean, I would do a vertebral column resection here because it's the lumbar spine, and I'd like to really go hammer at it. Mainly because there's no cord there, I'd really go aggressively. And try and take down, but it'll be a closing opening wedge. Here. Oh, it is like a, a conus uh, region. The yeah, like, but the osteotomy uh, will be at three, right? So I mean, at three or two. So I'm pretty okay with taking down the whole column, putting a cage there, and then closing over that. I don't have access to a robo, so I may call you in Shailesh. You will be the robo who can put the screws in, <laughs> and uh, it'll be we'll stop at five here, and uh, we'll go maybe three or three levels above, and try and get as much correction as possible. I don't think this is as challenging as it would be if this was in the mid thoracic uh, spine. So I mid thoracic VCR mid -thoracic, that that definitely is the worrisome because at the end of the day we're not, you know, and I don't mean to diminish this case, but you know, lumbar root pathology is a big difference between cord hemiparesis and and uh, so it is a much bigger conversation to have and and so yeah I mean people talk about conus level but. Maybe I'm just naive. I haven't seen many conus level injuries. We talk about it, but if you think anatomically, the conus narrows down. There's a lot of CSF fluid. There's a lot of protective areas in that level. So to me, I'm less worried about conus level surgery than I am cord level. Yes, Sajan, sir, your uh, tips now? Yeah, so uh, uh, definitely you would have to put a cage as you're closing the, 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 the wedge. Definitely, you would have to put a smaller cage and close it. And uh, that's about it. I don't know if there is anything else that I would have to, I would like to share. Do you, can you tell us what you did, Dr. Hardgaffer? Yeah, uh, we uh, did as uh, uh, both the both this um, masters told us. Uh, we did the uh, multi-level uh, osteotomy and uh, PVCR. This was the. Uh, all these were the thoughts before uh, we uh, did this and we planned like this. Two and a half, three levels uh, was our plan for the VCR. And we went all posterior. We first put the screws. It was uh, quite a rigid curve. There was no movement at all. Putting these screws were a little challenging, but uh, we were lucky. And if you see that it is completely, we have to study the anterior structures in this. Uh, Sometimes there can be a vascular issue or when we open up, but this was quite a challenge to open up the vertebrae. And we do the uh, double osteotome we use and uh, decompress uh, at the same time. We go anterior. You have to be very careful. You have to have a very good assistance. That is what we have realized in these kind of cases. Otherwise, it can be a very uh, challenging scenario. Uh, for whatever reason, it was not coming back. The reduction was not coming at all. Uh, we tried a couple huh. of maneuvers. 
we did all anterior cancellation till you know uh, complete uh, decancellation distraction but it was falling back because it was long standing and this is what we were <clears throat> then we uh, did the distraction with the rod but still and then uh, our team uh, helped with the uh, traction extension of the uh, lower limbs they kept it like that for a couple of minutes and it was falling back we used this uh, just to gently uh, hold it for reduction and we put the uh, cages anteriorly by using the small rods and vice grips very gently uh, we uh, distracted and put the cage anterior and uh, we were lucky to get the reduction at uh, that segment and we were unsure about the neurology because that was always a scare but all these five important steps which we realized anterior cortical thinning extension of hip uh, step three step technique distraction rod cage distraction and two small parallel sometimes there can be uh, additional help and uh, we were lucky to get a very good decompression and deformity correction and this is what the final picture was and now almost 6 7 years follow up we have we really don't know whether we should uh, now this is the current status looks very good did you try the cross uh, rod maneuver like one two rods sticking out and then pulling them down no that, no that no it's quite useful gives you a good long handle sajan anything else you would have uh, given any tips if yeah of, uh, uh, actually that's a very good way i think <laughs> the surgeon from uh, of ghanian origin was... boachi boachi dr boachi is the yes. head shown that one yes yes yeah. he, he it is his preferred technique and it's a very nice technique very nice technique right are you happy so with to that? me the, the biggest the biggest things here shilesh you kind of just brushed it but the most important things you did were you know positioning positioning is challenging in these individuals yes positioning understanding potential reduction maneuvers from the hip flexion extension those maneuvers all of those because without that people think that they just oh go in there cut this fusion mass down and yeah, things yeah. move around yeah. but there's so much ligament attacks contracted Absolutely. structures over the years that it makes it very very challenging and that time we didn't have we we, we were not having any oam or robot or anything it was all free hand techniques but no no i mean it's very nicely done i mean this is one of those situations where we go back to the enemy of good is better right so yeah, you know you you corrected her kyphosis you give her an opportunity to stabilize absolutely. and um you know at the end of the day no neurological injury and improvement of her significant kyphosis i'm sure she's very happy at this point yeah, right yeah yeah so <laughs> i think very nicely done awesome great Uh, anything you want to add uh, sajan else shailesh can uh, present the Excellent. last case on the round yeah great job yes uh abey uh, that one uh, uh, thing we uh, lesion you wanted to present and then i can present the last one or right, i can okay, present sure and... sure so um uh this is a lady uh, since we've not touched upon uh, tumors we'd like your insight on uh, this lady who's uh, again you know uh, admitted she's a known case of ca thyroid uh, no no treatment taken she was planning systemic treatment when her back gave way and she's come with uh, kind of instability in the low back bilateral l5 weakness uh, she's pretty disabled and she's uh, almost lying there in bed and she's looking for a solution that's her x-ray if you are okay with what data you have uh, we'll move on that's the mri scan uh, l5 weakness maybe 4 by 5 bilaterally but she's in disabling pain uh, so much so that uh, the thyroid guy has said i'll deal with the thyroid later you please figure out a back um this, these are the mri cuts and then um, her pet shows just one more solitary lib uh, rib lesion small small uh, thing but nothing else at this point uh, kern any thoughts on how to manage this so what you're you're really trying to present is an isolated met oligometastasis at l5 yes yeah so solitary met l5 and um instability from this we'll call it like this tumorous burst fracture at L5 how do you address this um and so you know 
some people argue, and I don't necessarily argue that, that there's a value in, in an on block type resection, et cetera. I think that doesn't, thyroid is a little bit different beast. To me, it's just, this is someone that has a better prognosis with the single lesion, whether that be intralesional resection or not. I think that we can argue that the merits. So to me, this is more of an approach related issue. How am I going to approach this individual? And I'm looking at your axial cuts. And if I look at the axial cuts, um, to me, vessels are very wide at 5'1", and with a, a working window at the 4'5 level. So, and I can see the, the crossing vein at the L5 body. So I would, I would actually go through an OLIF type approach for resection of this vertebral yeah, body. So to me, it seems like I could get, I could get a working corridor between a lateral 5'1 ALIF and a four five uh, OLIF, and I can work in between both of those. I would uh, do, essentially it's just glorified discectomies of four five and the five one disc space. And then it's falling into a void that is the, the burst fracture and egg shelling it out and resecting it out. Uh, and this is where expandable cage in my hands works very well. So I can just go back and forth between the vein and I can slide the cage in and more likely than not, I would put in um, single position pedicle screws into L4 and into S1, um, uh, very robust, eight, five screws, very large diameter screws eight, into those two level. I go single level construct. So our two level, I guess four to one would be my, my uh, take. What do you fill the cage with? So um, yeah, so in general, this is a question. So I grew up on bone, on BMP. And people will argue BMP in a tumor is contraindicated. But one of the pioneers of BMP was Scott Bowden. Scott Bowden was one of the original surgeons and I trained him, underneath him. And he actually felt in some, some of the studies that BMP actually leads to a differentiation as opposed to a de-differentiation of tumor cells. And so I felt very comfortable using BMP in this situation. But the reality is a large cage, favorable bone stock, you know, I wouldn't necessarily have to use BMP. I, I would use some kind of graft extender, pack in the disc base, with solid support, these heal in very favorably, very favorable environment. Would you worry about bleeding here, given that it's a thyroid uh, primary? Yes, 100%. So we do prophylactic embolization, preoperative embolization. I don't know the value of it. And we, it's more so for like kidney, for renal. That's the main. But our, our, our IR guys, interventional radiology guys are very good. And they'll find bleeders into or feeders into the, the tumor site, and they will embolize for me um, very quickly right before surgery. It makes it seamless. So yeah, you you definitely have bleeding, and, and that's the biggest concern. But the the beauty of a a lateral approach, OLIF, ALIF, is that the whole wound is not opened up, and it's very focal. So in general, I find that it's it's much more it's much more containable, and you also the bleeding pools it pulls inside the corpectomy as you're going in. So I find it a little bit easier to manage that way, but it definitely is a concern that I would have IR take a look at beforehand. Sajan, do you have a diverse thought process on managing this? Actually, I like what uh, Kern uh, mentioned and uh, the single position laterally is something that we are using more and more with the robot. And uh, we were talking about the pros and cons of doing it like an OLEF approach since we are not very experienced with that, uh, with that access, uh, but it seems like a very doable, uh, you know, simple, straightforward, uh, single one day procedure, which would make the patient pain-free and walking the next day. My, so, you know, my take on this Sajan is, you guys are phenomenal. And I always say this phenomenal posterior surgeon because you've had to do so much posteriorly. The Indian population is so ripe for a OLIF anterior to psoas approach that if you see it a couple times, it will be like doing an ACDF. And it will change. What you guys have done on posterior column osteotomies, VCRs for tuberculosis, et cetera, made you guys so technically very good. OLIF is, it really just makes it easier. It sounds more complicated, but it just makes everything so easy as far as like reduction, as far as exposure is concerned. And it, it, and it also eliminates the need 
that you don't need an access surgeon. You don't need someone there. You can just do it in your hospital. I think it's game changing. And in this case, it's game changing for exposure. Fantastic. Shailesh, any, uh, anything else? Would you do something different? No, I think I agree with uh, Sajan, sir. Absolutely. Right. So what we posted her for is a posterior up one, one up, one down with uh, decompression and cementing. And uh, that's what yeah. we, we do typically in these because these are beyond resections because it's already spilled over and uh, it's got a very good favorable medical plan of treatment. So it does not really need, it's uh, not, it's sensitive to uh, iodine. So we, that's the plan actually, rather than uh, doing a resection. Um, Chai, yeah, we used to do that. We used to do like a mini rebar. You put K-wire pins and a cement in and then put screws and they do amazingly well. Yeah. Shailesh, uh, last yeah. case, we are yeah, last uh, case, yeah. 96 minutes already. We've kept the gentleman away from a lot of things. Yeah, just uh, let me share the screen. But great discussion, guys. The inside is fantastic. This has given a different spin to, I think, all our listeners. Because, um, you know, Kern, you've brought in an entire different school of thought from the West. And Sajan from the East has hammered down another very different thought process that uh, we guys on the West Coast of India are getting sandwiched between. But I think there's a lot of good learning. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is the screen is uh, there? Away? Visible, yes. Yeah. So he's a 58-year-old man. Uh, uh, back pain around 7 to 8 on 10 was the vast. Uh, occasional left leg pain, palpable implant, and he was a CEO of a company, very demanding. Three to four years, persistent pain he was having. And this surgery was done around 6-7 years back. Pain on turning, moving, no neurological deficit. So, can I be brutally frank? Yes, sir. <laughs> so, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a surgery looking for a cause. And it has not found that cause. And it has not treated whatever was perhaps uh, give, disabling the person. Yeah. And that it has only made things worse. Correct. Uh, and I see some laminectomies... Yeah, it was done at around uh, L. Yeah, L which I feel before. are uh, again without any basis, and so it's all uh, led to a a problem. Now I think it is uh, something which Kern would be very well be able to address, and that is all about sagittal imbalance. Yes, yeah, no, I agree with you, Sajin. This is this is a case in which you are fixing a surgery gone awry that may have, the indications are definitely vague. So now this is actually, I love these cases because at the end of the day, it's just fixing a problem and, and you will see improvement, but ultimately the patient is much more forgiving in their expectations of, uh, of you know, where they've gotten to at this point. And he was, Do you have he was, a CT scan, Shilesh? Yeah, and yeah, we have. And he was very much, uh, you know, uh, concerned. He was not very keen for the primary surgeon to treat him anymore. He said because of him, this happened. We have to be, yeah. uh, you know, explain them, you know, this can happen. But uh, this is how the demanding patients can be. This is the MR and there was a disc at uh, 3-4 also. If you see that, that the foraminal disc at 3-4 and this is a CT scan. So essentially he has a... He has, he was fused in kyphosis. He has a non-union or, you know, not necessarily with instrumentation failure. And he has a 3-4 H&P is what I see it at this, at this point. So for me, this is actually a great case. I, I do it, I, I, stage one, I take out the hardware. Okay. Percutaneously, percutaneously cut rods, and take it out. And then I uh, do a uh, decompression of 3-4. Okay. Um, I don't do a fusion there. I don't think that extending this guy is going to have any benefit because three, four, then four, five is symptomatic. Four, five looks like, you know, radiographically some early stage degeneration. So my goal is to treat the, if you believe three, four is symptomatic to treat that H and P and then to fix his kyphosis at a, you know, that, that, um, we'll call it five, four, five, four, three, two, one, 12 to 12 to 12 to three which should in general not be kyphotic, which should be neutral at, you know, worst case scenario. And that is done very, very effectively through laterals. Okay. So, so I would have done it two stage. So hardware removal and then decompression of three, four stage one, go to lateral, lateral him, 
and restore his uh, kyphosis and single stage perk fixation back in uh, and be done in a two stage procedure. Yes, he actually suffered a lot with back pain, you know, sitting because he, he was telling that he couldn't sit for the meetings which he has to attend. And therefore, he's losing a lot of uh, revenue for his company. He was very, very... Well, that's if you believe... That's your, you're trying to tell me that you believe that his back pain could be a component of, of 3, 4, 4, 5. And I'm going to say to him, I don't know if it's 3, 4, 4, 5. I think it's because you could be non-union at the levels above and you're in kyphosis at those levels exactly, above. Exactly, exactly. So before I, I, be, before I make you worse, I'm going to fix the original intent of the problem or the treatment. And then we'll have to address what's going to go on because I, I, the worst thing I could do is I could extend you and you're no better. So the, the best thing is for me to fix you and then to reassess. It's always easy for me to add on the additional levels at some point. Understanding his impatience, and I get that. Yes, Sajan, sir. So I generally agree with uh, uh, Kern. I wanted to know from Kern, uh, which levels would he help create a, a, a correction of the kyphosis, would he put into body reconstruction at all the levels or at some? No, of I think, I think it's his proximal two levels that are really the ones that are the, the, the ones where he starts leaning over. And it's probably the most, the most one would be the proximal level. So, okay. you know, my, my goal at that point is to get the, you know, like we always talk about, like, T10 to L2 better be straight. I mean, at that, so I will do whatever it takes to get those segments to line up because he, he's collapsing over the top of his construct and he's focally kyphotic at that T12 L1 level and L12. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, by what you will that's do. Why he's pulling, and that's why he's pulling out, right? He's falling, he's pulling yes. out. It's not, it's the spine moving away as opposed to his screws pulling out. It's the spine yes, falling the, forward. Yeah, the, 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 the nuts are falling apart and everything is falling apart. Yeah, Abai. Hello. Abai, your, yeah. your mic. Yeah, I, I do a small, I do multiple small posterior column shortenings and try and correct uh, the biomechanics of the spine and uh, just fix it uh, inside to maybe do a interbody job also. It, it doesn't and look... You, no extension of the fusion, just the yeah, levels that were done previously? Most likely one above because the, we probably have busted those L1 screws. So I don't think I'll get okay. a great hold. One or two is like bones are looking a bit porotic also. Yeah, yeah. So most of my patients of this denomination are backed up by teriparatide. You know, take it or love it or hate it. But I just give them teriparatide for an extended time post-op to save my... Yeah, there's no harm in that. There's no harm in that. I agree. I mean, I don't think yeah. that... What's the downside? It may, yeah, so I mean, I, I uh, people that's... point fingers that he's 58, but if that's going to save my surgery, then I don't mind, you know, doing uh, yeah. six months, yeah. 12 months. Okay. I'm supportive of that. I agree. Shailesh, what did you do? Ah, okay. Uh, we uh, mixed both and we uh, did the revision of that. Uh, these are the 3D CTs. And we uh, removed the uh, implants and uh, connected above and below. And we decompressed that 4-5 segment also. <clears throat> and uh, ah, long fixation. Yeah, going proximally is no harm on this guy in the sense that yeah. if yeah. you're going to go proximally, get them back to neutral, which is what you did. So I'm, I, I have zero, zero um, critiques of that. I think at the end of the day, the worst thing we could do is leave him in some kyphosis that's going to ultimately worsen over time. So. And some, sometimes these are so demanding. They, they, this guy was doctor. I don't want any other surgery. I said, I can't promise that, but what, whatever. But I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Indians are demanding. Come mm. on now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dr. Shailesh uh, attends to the most elite class of patients in our country. So, uh, you know, we got to separate him from the others. Uh, Shailesh, that last one that you wanted to present. Because, yeah, I'll just uh, one a quick uh, last one. Uh, because he's really uh, waiting for uh, the opinion of these masters. So you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this guy is, again, uh, this is a lady. Uh, just a second. Okay. Okay. Sajan, you're still at work? Uh, well, I... I, I are you just avoiding the fa are you avoiding the family or what? What was it? It was just faking the at work. It's a Sunday here. It's a Sunday evening. Yeah, here. I know Sunday evening. <laughs> Look where <laughs> I am. 
Uh, yeah, I see that. No, yes. but I thought it was best for uh, for my team to be here because for the earlier one, I had one of my fellows do the presentation of the case. Okay. I came to the hospital. It's just next door to to my to where I stay. So that's okay. okay. And yeah. this is the last case. Uh, is a seventy-five-year-old lady. Is this uh, screen is there now in front of you? Yeah. And uh, no comorbidities. Fall at home around four weeks. A local doctor gave medications. Pain in back. Turning on side difficulty. Unable to bend. How will you approach? So, so sir, T12 looks like a benign osteoporotic vertebral fracture. Correct. Yes. yes. Yeah, T12, is that what we're, that what we're saying here? Five, yeah, four, yeah. Three, two, one. Yeah. So you're really asking like um, duration of symptoms. Is it appropriate for some cement augmentation, you know, at the, at the end of the day? And for us, you know, the real determination is, is the comorbidity of recumbency or inactivity greater than the intervention? So yeah, for me, you, this is, and this is someone who seems, that. yeah. And so this is someone who is, who is exhibiting that. So I have a low threshold for a percup percutaneous cement augmentation here, kyphoplasty. Uh, you're happy with the place where the fracture is, like oh, close to the end plate? Do you think it's... Uh, yeah, so, yeah, no, so there's some, go to the, if you go to the MRI, you're, there's some technical pearls, you're right, absolutely. So at the end of the day, you will have, I, I have no doubt you will have some cement extravasation into the disc space. You will have not true restoration of the entire vertebral body, all of that. My, my goals are this, that you may you may get none of that, but the stabilization of the fracture alleviates their pain in these individuals. Yeah. And it's interesting. And that, I mean, and that's all they really want. And they're low demand. As some people say, well, it's thoracal lumbar junction. There's some other issues, but you never see gross retropulsion of these. You never see like catastrophic kyphosis and failure. Yeah. What you're really saying is older individual incapacitated, and a T12 level, I think a cement augmentation, understanding you'll get cement extravasation but, and not yeah, ideal. Because this type. patient was very keen for no, no intervention as possible. She was like okay. that. You know, she was in pain, but she was saying, hey, doctor, can you just treat me without any surgical procedure? But just hanging out to that, like, how soon just, do you offer your cement augmentation? Uh, like what day you zero practice, or... Normally, in India, that is what we want to know about. Okay. So uh, you, she just wants she wants you just to do a puja or something and then heal her. Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? yeah okay. So, <laughs> so I, in general, in general for us in the United States, there's two types of fracture patterns, or two types of fracture presentations. Those that present acutely and are in the hospital, in the emergency room, and hospitalized. Those people we cement right away because they're not leaving otherwise. There's a reason why they're there. And the cost of not going back to work in the United States is much greater than the healthcare cost. So the employers, everybody wants it. Get the cement procedure and move on and kind of get back to work. The second is the one that presents like this, intermediate period out, two to four weeks out. In general, I tell people, if she is not improving at four weeks, there's no reason why she's gonna improve at six weeks or eight weeks. You know, she's kind of going to have a slow, steady improvement, but if it's not quality of life changing, I intervene. If she comes to me at four weeks and she's like, you know what, I feel pretty good or I'm feeling better, then I say, don't do anything, wait it out. So you you you, you will wait for four weeks and not more? Uh, in general, four to six weeks, but not, it really depends upon their activity and their work requirements. Okay, okay. yes, uh, Sajan sir, how about you? So, uh, actually I'm learning uh, from Kern today that, uh, you know, till now, I used to be a little hesitant to offer cement augmentation to patients who came with acute fractures. Like, if they had a fall yesterday and they came today. Uh, uh, now I hear Khan saying that uh, that's doable. So that's an option we, I would like to have. Because some of them are. Well, no, no. I'm saying that I'm saying, Sajan, I'm saying that not if they show up in your office. If they show up in your office, I don't do that because it's not really that incapacitating. Oh, but if they're in the emergency, yeah, they, they do come to the emergency. And if, yeah, they if they're in the emergency room, if you look yes. at the 75 year old and they're yes. bedridden for two or three days, pneumonia, DVT, yes, yes. all those things become Correct. a factor. Absolutely. I have a low threshold to doing cement augmentation. Oh, oh, absolutely. So that's that's a good take home point, I think, for all of us that we can do it earlier also. Okay. And the six weeks uh, in, uh, interval before you intervene 
in those that are walking but yet painful is also a good idea agreed okay 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 that's that's what we wanted to know how to go about it because you know there are a lot of controversies whether you should just give medical management or you go for vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty or you fix it See, sometimes, uh, I don't know about Kern's experience. I'm sure he will agree with me. You know, you see these fractures. These are eminently uh, cementable. But if yes. you wait for a little while longer, and then they collapse, and uh, then it becomes, I think, a little difficult, challenging to fill them with cement. Uh, they, are, they are so thinned out, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think the debate has gone, it's gone, the pendulum has swung in the United States both ways. And the reality of which is, is now that the cost to do these procedures is so cheap. The uh, complication rate is so low. Yeah. This is something that we do under local anesthesia. No, you know, general anesthesia. They're awake. The cost to do the procedure is $800. The cost of the hospitalization every day is two or $3,000. The cost off of work. So now we've swung the pendulum of being much more aggressive for these people who are incapacitated. Yeah. Yeah. Kern, I just want to ask if this patient is now in front of you and she is telling, I'm better, my pain is better. What medical management would you like to offer her? So, uh, we, we, yes, we have all these national guidelines. Now we have to do what you did, which is they have to get a DEXA scan. They have to get classified. They have to see an endocrinologist, whether it be some type of... Um, bone supplement, hormone treatment, whatever it may be, they have to get done. Now, in the United States, we don't typically initiate that. So it goes off to the endocrinologist or goes to the primary care physician. But all of them get worked up like you just did with the DEXA scan. All yeah. of them have to get a formalized treatment, every single one of them. And if you don't do that, in fact, you get dinged by the national payers and you have to pay a fine. Okay, okay. What about you, Sergeant, sir? Yeah, I agree with that. And we also involve the endocrinologist in the treatment. What about you, Dr. Nene? So I'm diametrically opposite. I stay, I keep the endocrinologist as far as I can because they have no <laughs> idea about the patient on the ground. And they really pussyfoot, I must say, use this word here. They pussyfoot on these ones and they are not at all aggressive. So I've got a good handle on medical management of osteoporosis myself. And uh, I'm a member of the World Osteoporosis Federation, if you may. So I normally take uh, control of the situation and start uh, in the in the era of teriparatide. Once again, I have almost given up vertebroplasty for these edgy ones okay. because of uh, our patients. Ah, interesting. You know, some, interesting. Some problem like a cement ball going into the disc. They develop disc vertebral instability. We have actually published. Um, you know, we've had two publications on these uh, 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 intermediate time fallouts of uh, vertebroplasties, and this is one of the risk factors given that it's near the end plate. From an intraosseous instability, it becomes a disc vertebral instability, which comes back for a surgery, and the surgery gets uh, billed on your name. So basically, I just teriparatide them and uh, do tender loving care. Uh, when do you consider this once in a six month denosumab, and when you consider teriparatide? Any normally, kind of uh, ideally, three, uh, two and a half years of teriparatide, but normally we give one year of teriparatide. Uh, nowadays, in the combination therapy with denosumab, because it works 20% uh, better than standalone teriparatide and then we uh, you know move on with tenesumab alone along with extension exercises and uh, all the other works perfect thank you thank you very much uh, uh, abhay uh, dr karn singh and uh, sajan sir uh, any other questions abhay no i think we are fantastic and the insights that have come from uh, dr karn singh have been very very valuable trust me that uh, you know you there, it, there was a lot of skepticism about an american surgeon coming and telling us what to do and then clearly he's you know, <laughs> way outdone uh, you know the general impression of a uh, you know american surgeon in private practice i mean Stern, your uh, insights are absolutely spot on a lot of common sense a lot of logic and it really appealed to the masses i think and sajan of course is the folk hero in these parts so whatever he uh, says is the gospel and uh, sajan is just thank you for taking the time because until we saw you on the screen we were not sure if uh, you know Mr. Rajnikanth himself is going to be making that appearance. I, so, uh, I, I, thank you, I, both I, of you. I really would like thank to you thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It was a privilege. It was an honor. And Kern for giving uh, valuable time. Uh, at the same time, I would like to thank the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, uh, the Pune Orthopedic Society for unconditionally supporting us for these grand rounds, which are really becoming really popular. And we are getting a lot of insights from 
uh, the senior spine surgeons from this country at the same time uh, people from indian origin working great in um, us or uk and that's again a mix of both uh, different uh, things which we are getting in this grand round i thank you all uh, dr ashok sham and dr neeraj bijlani and the ortho tv team for supporting us for this uh, grand rounds uh, looking forward for the next one soon thank you very much signing off thank you thank you ashok are we off ashok himanchu yeah yes sir i just called ashok sir he'll be finishing the live stream but it is uh, continuing or it is stopped Hi, it, oh. it's still live okay so we'll stop it now yeah yeah but ashok sir is doing that as the rights okay thank you is done yeah yeah easier now